Good afternoon, everyone. This is Susan Manning from Learning Times, and I'd like to officially welcome you again to the fifth of our series of Connecting to Collections webinars. And it's, it's always a thrill to rejoin this group and to see who's um, coming in from all over North America. And you've got the business of chatting down pat. You can use that area not only to say hello to your colleagues, but also to ask questions throughout these presentations. We will hold questions until the very end for our presenters to get to. But uh, feel free to ask them there so they're in the archive and we can pull them out and then forward them later. Also, if for some reason you have some a need for technical assistance, don't hesitate to email us. Try to be as detailed as possible so we know the nature of your um, problem as we try to troubleshoot with you. We are recording these webinars. And if you go back through the main page in the way that you found us, you will get to a, a recording area and an archival area for each of the presentations. So be sure to check out the work that's been done previously and review what's happening today. And with that, I am going to introduce Larry Rieger from Heritage Preservation, um, IMLS, Heritage Preservation, and AASLH. Is uh, the, the three of them are sponsoring this webinar series, and we want to thank them. And Larry, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thanks, Susan. Um, to everyone, uh, I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of Heritage Preservation and the Association of State and Local History. Uh, our organizations have had the privilege of working closely with the Institute of Museum and Library Services on its co Connecting to Collections initiative. You will note on your screen we have two polls, uh, which you'll see a series of these. Uh, and the first one is, uh, we would like to know what part of the country that you're joining us from. And the second is, what kind of institution are you affiliated with? So if you could start uh, filling those out, we would be grateful. Uh, each of our speakers, in differing ways, have a considerable amount of experience in how to use collections care to reach out to the public and interest them in what we do to uh, take care of collections in our various institutions, whether it's conserving or rehousing an artifact or document or providing uh, proper environmental controls uh, in our storage area and exhibitions. I'm confident that if you adopt adapt or develop other outreach projects as a result of this webinar, that you will, one, increase your visitorship, two, gain new members, and three, find that it can be a tool to assist you in securing new and increased financial support. I'm now pleased to introduce Mamie Bittner, who is IMLS's Deputy Director of Policy, Planning, Research, and Communications who will give you a brief overview of IMLS's Connecting to Collections initiative and uh, some brief background about our presenters. Mamie, uh, take it over. Thanks so much, Larry. And it's a pleasure to be on this call. I, um, I have participated in a couple of the webinars, but I haven't had the opportunity to actually greet you all and uh, give a little introduction. And it's a real thrill to do this. Uh, I think that these webinars have been just wonderful and helped to uh, really expand and continue the conversation uh, that was started with the uh, Connecting to Collections uh, initiative. So I know that many of you are returning, uh, and so uh, returning uh, webinar participants, and so maybe familiar with some of this. But I wanted to just uh, uh, direct you to uh, information about the initiative uh, that's available on the IMLS website. And this is really a very rich resource of uh, multimedia as well as um, uh, re information about grants and online resources that can help you care for collections. So I encourage you to visit when you have a chance. And uh, I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, IMLS. Our purpose is to build the capacity of museums and libraries to serve the public. And we have three major goals. And the first one is sustaining cultural heritage and knowledge. Uh, we do that to enhance learning and innovation. And we believe very strongly that the 
uh, power of our museums and libraries and archives are really dependent upon people like you who are the people who are working in these institutions and uh, making them better every, every day. So to start off, actually I'm going to go back. To start off, uh, we have a poll. And Susan, I think, will put up the poll. Uh, and the poll is asking, uh, have you or your institution been a participant, a participant in the Connecting to Collections initiative? So uh, is the poll up there? It is up there. And I think what I'll do is I'll move this particular one over to the side. For some reason, my, my mouse is stuck. <laughs> Here we go. I'm going to move this one over here, and we can go forward with that uh, with the next slide while we ask them about the programs that they've participated in. How's that work for you? That's great. So this first poll is like a yes or no. Have you been involved uh, in the initiative? And then the second poll, um, which has this, uh, which is now I guess also in front of you, is asking, uh, going to. What kind of participation have you had? So uh, is it possible to move the poll so it's not in front of that slide? or? Well, I can try to shorten it up a little bit. That's, OK, I hope everyone can still read, still read that. But um, uh, this, this initiative has been going on for a few years now. And uh, the, the slide that's there now is showing uh, all of the different elements and moving parts of this initiative, uh, which started with this national summit and then launched a four-city uh, tour. Uh, we also had a uh, international meeting at the Salzburg Global Seminar. And then a variety of grant opportunities from the American Heritage Preservation Grant, which was an opportunity that we did in partnership with Bank of America, uh, statewide planning grants, which we've had every state and uh, many of the territories participate in. Uh, we've also given five implementation grants uh, that we're building on those planning grants. Uh, we're most proud of the bookshelf uh, project, which disseminated uh, nearly 3,000 of the uh, bookshelves across the nation and around the world. And, uh, and two, I believe, raising the bar workshops. But one of the things I think has just uh, been so terrific about this initiative is our partners, Heritage Preservation and AASLH, and also just the keeping the conversation going and keeping this community of practice uh, in touch with, with each other and providing opportunities for networking. So uh, you are all uh, great resources for each other, our participants on the phone call. And we have three really wonderful presenters today. And I'd like to take a minute. Uh, to introduce them to you. Uh, we'll start with Amber Kerr-Allison. Hi, Amber. Hello. Uh, Amber is a Paintings Conservator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Lunder Center. And the Lunder Center makes conservation visible and accessible to the public. Uh, if you've visited the Smithsonian, you know that anyone can go and take a peek at what's happening in the, uh, in the Lunder Center and see conservators in action. Well, obviously, the Smithsonian is a much larger institution than most of you are from. And Amber has spent lots of time interacting with the public and learning what's effective when trying to stimulate interest in collections care. And she'll share what she has learned with you. Susan Blakeney. Hi, Susan. Hi, everybody. Uh, Susan's a conservator in private practice in upstate New York. Uh, for many years, she's worked directly with, uh, with a very small museum in Skinny Atlas, New York on conserving their collection of paintings. Her work has involved not just the actual conservation, but also, and more to the point today, fundraising and generating public interest in the collection. Much of what they did could, could be done in your own institutions. And I know you'll learn a lot from Susan. And finally, we have Beth Tice. Hi, Beth. Hi. And Beth is um, at the Baylor University Library. Uh, she conducted public outreach activities last spring in connection with the American Library Association's Preservation Week. Her observations will be of interest to all of you who want to engage the public, and her tips are helpful whether you are doing outreach as part of Preservation Week or any other time of year. So welcome to you all.
Okay, and with that, we are going to take one presentation after another, and we're actually going to start off with Amber. So, Amber, you're in charge. Well, thank you for that introduction and for the opportunity to participate in the Con Connecting to Collections webinar series. I'll begin with an overview of the outreach programs at the Lunder Conservation Center and then offer some suggestions on how these programs could be adapted to suit the needs and resources of smaller institutions. The Lunder Conservation Center, uh, for those who don't know, is a floor-to-ceilings glass-walled facility that enables the public to view conservators working on artifacts from the collections of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and National Portrait Gallery. The facility is situated in the Donald W. Reynolds Center for American Art and Portraiture, located in Washington, D.C. The design of the Lunder Conservation Center provides the unique opportunity for the public to see firsthand how these collections are cared for. The self-guided tours through the center include educational kiosks with touchscreen technology, and the kiosks provide treatment videos, photographs, and a conservation tool menu. We also have wall didactics that are used um, to educate the visitors and used as speaking points during tours of the center. We have a 40-foot-long video wall uh, that provides a series of educational segments on collection care. All one needs to do is place their hand on the wall, and what will come up is the series of different videos, saving our treasures, save outdoor sculpture, and hearing from the professionals to really engage the public and let them learn a little bit about more conservation and the preservation of cultural heritage. We provide weekly public tours every Wednesday for behind-the-scenes descriptions of current projects, and conservators will often come out to interact with the groups and answer questions that they may have. We also organize um, particular tours for groups from the Girl Scouts to NASA rocket scientists, so we try to accommodate just about any group that approaches us. And our educational programs are designed for middle school to college-age students working in collaboration with the teachers and professors to offer informative programs and engaging projects that relate to the current curriculum for the students. And if we can, Susan, bring up the first of the three poll questions I'd like to ask, I'd like to see what educational programs for collections care are currently being offered at your facilities um, for those of our listeners. And please choose as many as may apply for you um, um, here in this uh, category. Is this you the know one what? For? I think I, I may have pulled up the wrong question. Oh, yeah, we here. want the educational one. <laughs> but I'm we can sorry. keep the other one up there for a little bit. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll let them go ahead and answer that, and we'll bring that one back. But here's the educational program. There we go, yes. If you could bring that one up, that'd be great. And if we could put it to the side a little bit, what I'm going to do is come back to these polls uh, with the answers for you all to see in just a little bit. So if we can put those to the side. Those are over here. Keep okay. answering. Oops. Yep, please, keep answering. <laughs> Sorry, my mouth just got sticky again. That's okay. Outreach activities um, at the London Conservation also include the gallery tours and the use of storyboards to discuss the conservation treatments of works on view in the galleries. We found this to be an excellent way of engaging the public in an object and giving them what they feel is sort of like insider information and connecting them to it with knowledge that few others have about the conservation and care of that particular artifact. We also provide free monthly conservation clinics um, where the members of the public can make appointments to bring in their artifacts and consult with a conservator to receive professional advice and reference materials on how to actually care for their collections. And since we've already got one of those polls up on um, the social media um, using uh, new media sources, I'd like to bring up that second one on the different types of what forms of social network might be most effective for your facility. So we could probably close off those other two polls if you want to for a moment and come back to those, um, the answers to them in a little bit. The Lunder Conservation Center engages with the public through the use of new media and social networking sites such as Twitter and Facebook as a means of updating and informing our fans on the progress of treatments, different research going on in the labs, public programs, lectures, and news on conservation and cultural heritage issues. This includes using new media sources, online publications and blogs to raise awareness, educate, and advocate for conservation and collection care issues. Now, it's understood that not all collections have the resources and program funds available that we have through the Smithsonian. And that's another key reason why the Lunder Conservation Center was developed, to increase awareness and educate the public on these issues so that our visitors contemplate the resources and needs of museums and collections in their hometowns. A popular question we ask our visitors is, do you know if the historic society or museum nearest you has a conservator or collection care manager on staff to care for the cultural heritage in your community? Most, um, uh, uh, most of the Lunder programs I have highlighted 
can be adapted to fit the needs of libraries and small collections. Let's take a few moments to step through and consider how that could be done. First, I must emphasize the importance of connecting the public to your collection. Finding the stories that interest and engage them with the cultural material in your collection is a key factor. As suggested by Debbie Hess Norris and many of the previous presenters in this series, cultivating the public's interest, providing a common link between the individual and the collection, builds their invested interest in the care and preservation of the collection and is a vital element to fundraising. Our gallery talks and tours have shown us that providing details on conservation treatments makes the artwork more accessible to our visitors. They learn about materials, construction, preservation issues, and the resources needed to care for the artifacts. They understand the labor, time, and skills that go into caring for the collection, and they relate to the artifacts more directly. They don't have to know the art movement or theories surrounding the work to feel they understand it. They're able to access it at many levels of knowledge and appreciate the importance of the resources needed to preserve it. When budgets and resources are limited, collaboration becomes an essential tool in the success of outreach activities. And many of these are partnerships that can be cultivated within your regional community. Some ideas uh, would include inviting local artisans to provide demonstrations on their working methods. And this could be from book binding to quilt making. The public program opens the door to your facility to meet a local artist, learn more about their craft and methods, and can be used to highlight items in your collection and the challenges of preserving these artifacts for future generations to see and learn from. Ask a conservator to give a lecture on caring for family treasures, such as quilts or photographs. Connect the theme of the talk to your collection so the audience understands the preservation challenges your institution faces while learning more about caring for their own collections. The conservator introduces their services to the community, the community benefits from their knowledge, and the awareness needs of the collection are raised. Collaborate with regional conservation groups to sponsor conservation clinics or to provide a service to the community. These groups, um, if you can consider them, these regional groups are often looking for facilities to host their monthly meetings at. And these meetings tend to include guest speakers for lectures open to the public. If your facility has the space to sponsor a meeting, and usually they only range in size of about 20 to 35 people, you'd be providing a lecture program for your public while establishing a relationship with the regional conservation um, community. These regional groups also often sponsor annual angels projects where volunteers come from their organization to the assistance of small collections and libraries for a day-long project such as rehousing a portion of the collection or providing a collection survey. And these preservation projects are a marvelous opportunity to promote the needs of your collections in the media as they provide incredible photo opportunities and storylines for reporters. Now what I'd like to do, Susan, if we can, is pull back that um, first poll on the educational programs. And let's take a look at what the results were for that. Would you be able to pull that oh, back I up? Oh, I can. I, we can do the big reveal right here. Yeah, the big reveal. Okay, there we well, go. And I'll put this in numbers, too. Okay, that's great. Well, it's wonderful to see how many of you are offering internships opportunities for college students. That's incredible. And it's a great resource for you. And we see that there are still a number of you that don't have anything at this time, but you know, hopefully we can help you with that and give you some ideas about how to engage with educational programs to pull them in a little bit. And we see those numbers are changing a little bit as some of you are continuing to answer, and that's great. Wonderful. Let's put that to the side for a moment while I continue speaking a little bit about education. Collaborating with the local schools has been a great success for our center. And it is a win-win situation with the students and the teachers that are involved in it. It takes learning out of the classroom and into the real world. And if you don't know where to begin with such collaborations, you know, look to the larger organizations. The ECROM website is one that I've put up here for you to kind of take a look at, but they offer a whole section giving creative project ideas to engage younger audiences in the care and preservation of cultural heritage. So use these major sites and see if they offer any kind of educational ideas that you could kind of capitalize on and reuse and do that outreach to the local school community. Work with regional conservation groups again to create family day events. These are really popular things, such as the one you see here, which is supported by volunteers from the Washington Conservation Guild. Uh, you basically design interactive learning activities, such as reconstructing shattered pots. This is a really popular event at the National Building Museum's annual family day each October. And the people from the guild come in, and they offer their time and services to introduce conservation and the care of collections to families through this really interactive event or creating didactics. And these don't need to be touchscreen kiosks or professionally designed didactics. 
simply using printed images, storyboards, or material samples can go a long way to increasing your audience's experience and understanding. When we give our tours, we often use small material samples and digital printouts to help us talk about treatments and objects. The public enjoys holding these materials and seeing how they work. And you'd be amazed at how intriguing a piece of Tyvek or silicone mold can be to a person who's unfamiliar with them. Center tours around the housekeeping and collection care activities you do in your own institution. Teaching the public about the importance of light levels, environmental conditions, and storage is a fundamental introduction to understanding the needs of your own collection while teaching them how to care for their own heritage. And incorporate collection care strategies into the programs for the collectors who contribute to your collection, providing copies of free literature that is often available at sites like the AIC or other conservation websites, uh, which offers free PDFs for caring for collections. So you can take um, you can basically take advantage of these resources that are available for free online or introduce your collectors to them and your audiences. Before I continue, let's take a moment to go back to those other two polls if we could. The first one on media sources and the second one on social networking sites. And let's see what the, the big reveal is um, for these. And for those who didn't get a chance to answer them earlier, please go ahead and um, answer that as well now. So you see how many people are really uh, using the social networking sites like Facebook is really popular. And websites, of course, and email itself, sending out those announcements to the people who are following you. Um, and let's see, let's see uh, how often is it used? A good, good number of you are using it often or occasionally with just a few in the rarely categories. Well, let's take a look and see how some ways it might be really interesting for you to start to use this great resource. It is true that social media sites can be a time sink, that many people just don't have the resources, experience, or staff to manage. But it's becoming increasingly more important to engage with the public in this medium. It is not going away, and everyone you consult with will have their own idea or light bulb inspiration, um, as my graphic is trying to show you here, on how to apply this exciting but intimidating resource for some. Let me offer some key points to consider as you venture down this road. First. There are many options out there for engaging with the public using new media and social network sites. Going with the most popular ones may not be the best for your institution, so don't force that square peg into the round hole. Yes, we use Twitter and Facebook at Lunder, but our Facebook postings feed directly into our Twitter page, which reduces having to post separately to each site. And our use of Twitter is slightly unconventional in that our information desks follow our postings to see when a conservator is working in view of the public. So they can, in turn, guide people up to the center to see what's going on in real time. So basically, when I sit down to clean a painting, I'll post something on Facebook or Twitter and say, you know, conservator on the fourth floor cleaning a painting. And the information does see that. And they tell the public, well, go up to the fourth floor right now. There's a conservator on view. Be creative with these sites. Sometimes their uses can really surprise you. Select a site that's going to um, enhance your virtual presence on the web. But make sure it's one you can support with the resources and time you have. And make certain it, to keep it updated. This is a key point if you want to keep your followers engaged with your site. Borrow news points and postings from other sites to keep your page looking fresh and updated. You don't always have to be the one writing the material. As an administrator um, on several Facebook pages, I use daily Google search updates to provide me with the latest news on different topics. Then I repost these articles or news points on the appropriate pages that I'm an administrator on. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes of my day, but the pages always have fresh material on them, and the followers really, you know, quote unquote, like the updates. Here is a particularly useful site administered by Nancy Ravenel, objects conservator from the Shelburne Museum in Vermont, and an earlier presenter in this webinar series. I strongly encourage you to take a look at this wiki site for, to learn more about the resources and examples of social media and their use in collection care. And I'm sure Nancy would welcome your own examples if you'd like to share them. You can also share your images and storage, stories with sites that be willing to publish them, such as the AIC Submit Your Own Story Selection. So if you are working with a conservator, they can actually take the story of whatever project they're working on and have it posted on this AIC site so that other people can see it. And this is open to the general public to read. So it's a great resource. Or you can become active in contributing information to resource sites, such as this Wikipedia Saves Public Art Project. And I could spend just 10 minutes talking about this particular site, uh, as well as Nancy Ravenel's site. Um, but take advantage of them. Look at them. See if there's something you can contribute to this broader uh, knowledge that people access. 
Share your collection care stories with online publications, such as Art Daily or local newspapers. These sources are often looking for new and fresh stories, even if they're small little paragraph snippets. Um, the first webinar in this series provided excellent insight and suggestions on using these resources to engage the public and support your collection care efforts. And for those who missed it, I would strongly encourage you to listen to the recording of it, as well as the other recordings that have been posted for you. This webinar series has been designed to provide you with the fundamental blocks that can assist you in building the programs needed to care for the, your collections. Use them, refer back to them, and hopefully, if we've all done our jobs well, some small bit of advice or direction provided to you will spark that idea you've been looking for. Now, I know the other two presenters have some excellent bits of knowledge and experience to pass along, and so I'm going to pass the baton on to them and rejoin you all during the questions and answers section at the end of the uh, presentations. But I'd like to thank you for your time for and inviting me today. Thank you, Amber. Um, and so now we are going to, tra to transition to Susan Blakeney's presentation. And Susan, you're up and in charge. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for um, giving me this opportunity to talk to you and tell you this interesting story about a grassroots approach that's proven very successful. When I began my business in 1975, I soon realized that the conservation of art and artifacts was almost a secret profession, and funding was a major problem. Since then, capturing the public eye to engage and educate the importance of what conservators do has been a mission of mine out of necessity. In addition to treatment services, we can mentor you, your staff, and your volunteers with consultations and workshops. Our lectures to the public will garner interest in your preservation projects and needs. We can also aid fundraising by helping you integrate the fascination of preservation into your exhibits with our documentation. Now for a question. How many of you have ever used a professional conservator? And I think this question is going up right there. And if you do need a conservator, how will you find one? Let me, um, I'm slow on the draw here. I'm going to okay. move this <laughs> over and, and this put up that you question. can just continue to answer as I'm talking, maybe. Right. So conservation activities are a mystery to most museum attendees. I have found that the public loves watching us work for small periods of time. Behind the scene tours and placing conservators on view during treatments has proven very successful to increase both financial and new collection donations by demonstrating active collection maintenance and sound stewardship. So. Uh, if we can move, yes, thank you. This um, stabilization treatment of flaking paint on a ladder truck was done on site at the Glenn Curtis Aviation Museum in Hammondsport, New York. They gave small tours to the visitors to briefly watch us work to promote the project and educate the public about collection maintenance. Here, after consolidation with an adhesive, flaking paint is being coaxed back into alignment after softening and relaxing with a hot air tool and a silicone burnisher. Saving the John D. Barrow Art Gallery collection has been a project of Westlake Conservators since 1977. I published an in-depth account of the first 10 years of the project in the AIC 1988 conference preprints titled, A Conservation Strategy for a Static, Non-Funded Collection, the John D. Barrow Art Gallery. Today, this terrific success story chronicles a newly lost collection's ongoing preservation tactics that demonstrates a variety of fundraising possibilities. John Dogson Barrow, a second-generation Hudson River School artist, erected a two-room gallery to house his collection of 354 paintings in ornate frames, which he gave in trust to the library and the people of Skinny Atlas. The gallery was initially funded with railroad bonds, which became worthless soon after the artist's death in 1906. As his style of painting fell out of favor, the collection fell into disrepair due to lack of funding and neglect. In 1977, when I made my first presentation to the library board in charge of the collection, they had no preservation funds, and 75% of the collection was unstable in active deterioration flaking. A harsh environment from a long-term leaking roof was the cause, and the building had just been restored. Temporary wood storage racks housed hundreds of damaged paintings. The first step in managing preservation of any large collection is a condition survey of the collection. Surveys are typically funded by grants and provide an opportunity for a professional conservator to examine every work and write brief condition notes for a future benchmark. Assisting staff will learn important facts about the collection and preservation tips. 
My staff and I began in storage and combined photography with emergency treatment to freeze conditions of the flaking paintings until treatment funding could be found. Working with volunteers, we color-coded the survey exams and tags with blue sound and OK to exhibit, yellow caution monitor, and red unable to exhibit in need of preservation. We had to increase individual funding for the large number of seriously deteriorated paintings requiring major treatment and to aid a continuing storage problem. To this end, a borrow a barrel program was introduced. A representative selection of 19 red-coated paintings in danger were hung on one wall in the gallery with very visible cleaning tests and estimates for conservation treatments. A contractual agreement was drawn up whereby a donor could borrow a painting for one year period if they financed his conservation and insurance coverage for the period of the loan. This was renewable up to three years depending upon the amount invested in the treatment, and I prepared a general care handout sheet to accompany the loan. The gallery's operating budget of $8,000 was raised annually in November by a direct mailing to appeal for donations. The Merchants Association agreed to display barrel paintings in shop windows concurrently with the appeal. Paintings were selected by size, condition, and suitability of location. I cleaned half a painting for a conservation display, and the gallery was open throughout shopping hours. Today, their budget has risen to almost $19,000 and typically receives $10,000 from the annual mailing fund drive. Satellite exhibition venues such as city, mall, and airport window displays will also draw visitors to local collections. Plan and offer to make presentations to your local chamber, merchants association, and other organizations to get their support and keep them informed of your exhibition goals. One year, the Chamber of Commerce financed the printing of a quality calendar reproducing barrels composite of the month, marketed in village shops with profits to be donated to the gallery. The design of a new brochure was donated by a local designer, and we offered postcard reproductions. Develop connections with local organizations. Every year, the Garden Club decorates a synthetic tree with historic Christmas ornaments as another gallery draw, combined with caroling at scheduled times. It's important that every success story is submitted to the local press to share in the ongoing activity and encourage more donations. Our best fundraiser has proven to be memorial restorations. The sentiment attached to seeing the name of a loved, cherished, or respected individual or organization etched into a brass plaque and mounted on a frame combined with the satisfaction of contributing to preserve our heritage has thus far resulted in over 185 individual conservation treatments. The Rotary Club raised money over three years to restore one large painting and had a sign next to it saying, Preservation Funding Reserved by the Rotary Club. Names are also recorded in a donor's book on display in the gallery. Every year, the Scanny Atlas fourth grade classes visit the gallery and write poems about the paintings. The Gifted Horizon class of 2000 on the left designed and implemented one of the most successful fundraisers after being stimulated by my lecturing to them about climate control, comparing brittle paint to eggshells and why it's important for museum collections. They raised funds for the first digital data loggers to monitor conditions in the barrel gallery, and then they decided to take it even further. They came up with a slogan, saving our history is dirt cheap. And after researching the era that Carolyn and John Barrow lived, in, they developed a fundraising plan that started by growing period seedling flowers in recycled eggshells early spring to sell. They picked a Saturday and dressed in period costume with baskets of seedlings on their arms and a photo of the portrait by John Barrow of his sister Carolyn. They knocked on almost every door in town asking, will you like to help save Carolyn? And a raffle downtown at a table in front of the library with a life-size public barometer of success capped it off. Our community population is about 4,000, and they raised nearly $1,600. They were so successful that they raised enough money to also clean this small child's portrait. The student's teacher entered their project into a statewide contest, Good News, Good Kids Youth Responsibility Award, which they won, and they were invited to Albany to meet the governor. This made the evening news and again brought more publicity. I made a story poster showing the examination report and treatment record with documentation images for display in their school corridor window, thus involving the entire student body with the project. The project ended with a special celebration for the students and their parents of the completed painting with a brief slide lecture of the treatment and the children reciting what they had learned from the project. Interesting use of your collection for lesson plans with local schools is a win-win situation. Stimulating youth to become involved in projects creates patrons at an early age, and typically their parents follow through with their interests. 
And now I want to ask you if any of you have an annual budget for preservation. So if you don't, it's a good thing to try to get a budget line in. And this preservation line can not only use, be used for treatments, but also just for maintenance materials. Now, our float was another successful idea for keeping the gallery in the public eye. Barrow's self-portrait was easily recognizable to the huge public crowd. A simple A-frame construction with a look-alike J.D. Barrow played the part. A parade is a captivated crowd which may be used to promote your collection. We also won a Labor Day Parade float prize with a picture in the press and more free coverage. It's important that every treatment donation, and especially grants, receives press coverage in some way. A photo of the donor in front of the completed painting with the gallery director is most typical. Whenever possible, contact the local press for coverage before, during the treatment, or as a follow-up when completed. This dramatic treatment received good press coverage, and there was a special opening and celebration, again inviting past donors and possible new sponsors. This collection has continued to grow with more donations of his paintings. A tremendous amount of progress has been made since the reopening. They completed a CAP survey in 2007, followed by a MAP survey in 2008. Major recommendations were to begin an environmental monitoring program and install an HVAC system, develop a new mission statement and bylaws, create a new brochure and a website including online giving with the ability to process credit card donations. All of these have been nearly completed through grants and the gallery's financial reserves. Every year, the gallery creates miniature replica paintings for sale to be used as ornaments and gifts. In this way, Barrow is kept in the patron's eyes and thoughts. This ongoing preservation story has evolved over 35 years. I want you to realize and be encouraged that preservation progress may be slow but steady with the help of the public, innovative ways to capture their interest, and press coverage. In conclusion, to try to involve the public by offering programs to capture their interests while also promoting your own goals is always a good idea. Along this same vein, a great resource for public outreach is the popular May Day program held annually in the months leading up to May 1st. A lecture or workshop on emergency preparedness for family heirlooms would be an excellent companion event. So if you have a gift shop, try to sell books relating to preservation that are of interest to the public, like caring for your family treasures and carry for your collections, both available from Heritage Preservation, and How to Save Your Stuff from a Disaster, written by a conservation colleague, Scott Haskins, in 1996. These books provide do's and don'ts for preventive maintenance and recommendations for emergencies. To find a conservator, go to the AIC website, www.conservation-us.org. But another emerging referral website, www.artcare.com, with former AAM president Ed Abel as director, is designed to promote preservation by providing museums and private collections with many art-related services in one place. Thank you, and please keep your questions until after the next presentation. Thank you, Susan. And um, I'm going to pause for a second to let the audience know that after our event, you will be able to get a copy of each of our presenter's slides, and so you can have these links. But while I'm pausing, if you click on one of these hyperlinks, it will open, that website will open in a different browser window. So if you're really fast on the clicking, you can do that before I transition to Beth Tice. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to do that and to know that you will get copies of the slides. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to Beth's presentation, and she will take over from here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks, Susan. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about ALA's Preservation Week and what we did in Waco, Texas, which is cent centrally located in Texas. And I see we do have some Texas folks online greetings. Um, we are, Baylor University is a, probably a middle-sized li library in comparison, but we have a very, very small group of people working on preservation, which is actually just myself and one part-time person. So um, for us, preservation is continually uh, something we have to work very hard at. And so, so we have working extremely hard at 
finding, identifying partners in the community. It's the only way that I can get help to get some of this work done. We don't have a conservator. We just have myself and someone else working on preservation. And so when Preservation Week came up, I thought this was an ideal time for us to tap into some, some outside help. Um, the pictures you see in my slides are from an event we held last year, last spring, for Preservation Week. And this coming spring, it will be April 24th through the 30th. Um, one of the, from the um, Heritage Preservation, Heritage Performance Report Index stated that 80% of collecting institutions have no paid staff assigned for collections care, and that's kind of where we were at at Baylor. So we really were reaching out, and Preservation Week helped us do that. ALA has partnered with others like Heritage Preservation to encourage libraries and other institutions to use this week to connect our communities through events, activities, and resources that highlight what we can do individually and together to preserve our personal and shared collections. And because we were such small staff for preservation, this was the perfect, perfect opportunity to get some help. Um, and so what I'd like to do first is find out and move our poll over and find out if you have ever heard of Preservation Week or participated in, in this last year was the first year. And my guess is we didn't have too many. And that's what it looks like is about 80 to 90%. Um, so this might be a real perfect opportunity to introduce you um, this week. And I'm going to move to the next slide. You can And I'll just put the poll, poll up yeah. there in the corner okay. and they can continue. Okay. Oh, well, well, great. We've got some people interested in doing it for this spring. So if you, I included on the past slide, I included the, the link, but you can also do just search for Preservation Week on Google and it'll pop right up pretty fast. Um, on the site, it's a wonderful resource for you. It doesn't matter if you're a large library, a small library, or a very small society. They have program ideas. They have a, actually a speakers bureau where you can go in and find speakers. They have lots of tips on how to plan an event, how to get funding. They include um, just custom-made kits for press releases, which is very helpful for us because we really don't have that skill here in Central Texas in our small community. Um, they also included artwork and logos. You'll see the Pass It On Preservation Week. That's a logo that you can grab off their site. They have lots of handouts for you to use on just to pass out to the public and um, bookmarks, all kinds of things you can download or you can order. And again, more tips on how to get more partners and how to work with your community. So it's a, it's a wonderful site and they have a lot of information. They are working on it right now to get it updated for this spring, but um, there's still lots of helpful information on the site. So I do have, from our event last spring, I do have three tips and I'll, I'll talk about this a little more, but tip one, work with your community partners. Since we're so small and we have so few staff, we had to get help. So we started with our community. Number two, start with just one event. Number three, keep it simple. So here's just some basic facts about Baylor University and the Waco community. Um, we had two events last year. The first one was a disaster planning lecture for the people in our city that had responsibilities for collections. This included museums, historical societies, our, our city chamber. We have several uh, historical churches downtown that kind of have a nice community. And then our second um, event was a preservation clinic. And I believe someone from um, College Station mentioned having the kind of antiques roadshow type thing. And that's what this was. It was a preservation clinic for the entire community. Our partners helping with this event included some local historians, genealogists, oral historians, some preservation experts. A few of our state library representatives came up, and we also um, had a local photographer who has a restoration business in town come and help with that event. So yes, we did num tip number one. We used our community very much so, and it worked very well. It even gave us, helped us with the space that we used. We were able to get a, just recently, it had only been opened a month, a renovated hotel from the late 1800s, 
and the company let us have it for free, it would have cost us about $3,000, but one of the city managers had helped get the building up and running, and so they kind of talked them into it. So that was another wonderful community outreach for us. So step, tip number two, I didn't start with one event, and it got very busy very quick. So remember tip number two. Um, we started with the two events, the disaster planning and the clinic, and it would have been better and easier if we just focused on one event. And that's one of the pieces that the ALA group working with the Preservation Week is trying to highlight this year is don't try and do too much. Just start with something small, start with one event, and then really focus on that and make it your best, best um, effort. Third tip was keep it simple. Well, we sort of kept it simple. Um, you'll notice this is another one of our um, flyers that went out for the clinic, and Jeannie Drews was one of our speakers, um, and she was, I mean, we were just so lucky to get her come in, and so it was really wonderful. She did an amazing job. But when you bring in the community for a clinic where they could bring all their materials, I mean, this is a learning experience for all of us, um, that can quickly get very complicated, and you'll notice our little note at the bottom, no weapons of any kind are allowed. Well, yeah, we're, we are in Texas, and um, one of the first things I learned from the genealogist that worked with us was, you know, they're going to bring in their guns. They're going to bring in their swords and stuff. So we, we decided that that wasn't a, uh, anything we really wanted to deal with, so we went ahead and did write it on the flyer, which was kind of funny to some people, kind of scary to me. Um, so what worked? We had an amazing turnout for our community. I mean, it was just a huge turnout. And we loved their stories. You know, I was so wrapped up in the things. I was so, so wrapped up in the objects and what, you know, our speakers. And when the, the, the community came and started telling us the stories that are wrapped up around each of the, one of their items, it was wonderful and it was amazing. So it really defined the whole event and made it an excellent um, thing for both us and for the community. We did have very specific goals. And that was important. We tried not to let the mission of what we were trying to do creep out and try and accomplish too much in, in one event. Um, our PR skills, I had an excellent staff member who was great at providing those, you know, putting those flyers together. And then having Jeannie there as our speaker was just amazing. Our location was right downtown, so everybody could come to that hotel, and it was easy. Everybody knew it was there, and it was, a, you know, in all the papers, the opening of the building, so it was great. And we were able to pull in a, a real varied group of people, so that was, that was really important in pulling in many, many, many more people that we wouldn't have pulled in if we had just gotten one person from Baylor to be a speaker. Um, surveys at the end, and we had lots of giveaways. A lot of the companies like Gaylord are more than happy to send you extra kind of giveaway materials, and so the, the public really liked that. What didn't work? Here's a picture you can see is our, um, the hotel lobby as you come in. So it was a beautiful building, beautiful space. What didn't work? Two events was just too much for us as our first try at this. And since there were only a couple of us planning it, it was just it was a little much for us. And I found out that our experts need a lot more wrangling than I thought they would. Um, they uh, were wonderful, but uh, they needed a lot of more attention than I gave them as far as just making sure they you know showed up on time and all of that stuff. <laughs> Disaster planning lecture, our first event, would have probably been better if we did it more as not a lecture but as a workshop to allow some more takeaways. So instead, you know, we asked these people to come in and spend their whole evening with us. We should have probably given them um, more information that they could have worked on, like maybe the beginning of a disaster plan or something where they could have left with more information than just kind of links to things and um you know, handout. So I think that that should have been planned a little better as a workshop. But what are we going to do for next year? We're going to keep it smaller. I am going to just do one event, but what has happened from this last year is that the community has gotten so excited about this week that our genealogist and our um, county library folks are partnering with us this year 
and we are focusing on Civil War materials because it's the 150th anniversary of the start of the Civil War in 2011. So we're going to focus on that, and um, there's going to be a whole week of events, but I'm only responsible for one night. And the community partners are the first night will be the historical, the genealogical society is going to have their regular meeting and we're going to, you know, use that meeting to talk about preservation of their materials. But the night that, that we're there, we're going to actually take one of our collections of Civil War letters that we've digitized and have a dramatic reading because it's a, it's a collection of letters back and forth between a Texas cavalryman and his fiance. And so we're going to have two folks read those and really try and emphasize the importance of the stories behind these so that they can kind of make that connection like Susan had talked about earlier, that connection between your own stories and these materials um, moving ahead. So some inspiration for you all. I mean, there's been some wonderful examples so far, but try looking at this. I've create, put this URL, um, the Michigan Alliance, it's the Michigan Alliance for the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. It has a wonderful web page up where they've combined a statewide kind of group, and it's a, it's a statewide web page for libraries, archives, museums, historical societies, and preservation networks. It's a really wonderful resource. And that's a great way to look at how they've pulled their communities together to create one place for information about preservation. Um, starting with one event, I loved Milwaukee Public Library last year, did a um, their title for their event was Don't Leave Grandma in the Attic. Love that title. And don't forget the stories. In um, Santa Cruz County School District in Arizona, the students, like with Susan's students, these students shared personal stories of how they preserved their own collectibles that they had that were of value to themselves. And I think having those students connected to it, young students, makes a huge difference. And then I would... Cons um, recommend that you look at digital storytelling. This is the University of Maryland, Baltimore County link. Um, digital storytelling is kind of a new fad word, but it's basically taking oral history and video and um, preservation and putting it all together in one package. And it is a, it is a wonderful, wonderful web page that has lots of examples that you can go look at, but they have some um, wonderful um, digital stories of letters, you know, sent back and forth during the war, and and just even some student projects and faculty projects. It's a it's a great page to go to get some inspiration on what might work for you all. It's it's a little complicated for me where I am to put together because I'm not sure about the technology, but I think I've been able to use some of that information with our Civil War, our dramatic reading, to be able to put together a nice event. So thank you so much, and just keep remembering our the simple the simple things that we learned from last year is to work with our community partners because that's been a huge, huge benefit this entire year because we've made some new friends and found out where some expertise is, and it's helping us do things we would have never been able to do on our own. Keep with one event because the bigger you start to plan, the the more complicated and it gets, and then keep it simple and. Um, um, we, we had a, a, a tremendous year last year, and we're really looking forward to this next year. So I thank you very much, and I think we can start looking at questions. Okay, great. Um, and I put that last poll okay, up there thank you. so the audience can kind of fill in if they've worked with um, other partners in the community. And um, audience, feel free to put your questions in that chat area. I would like to start out with a basic question that came in from Kim Kenny in Canton, Ohio. How are you defining preservation versus conservation? And this would be a question that I would field to each of you. So let's start with Amber and then Susan and then Beth. Certainly, thanks. Um, that is actually a question that we start most of our public tours off with because it is it's so commonly people use those interchangeably. But um, we will defer to the definition that is on the AIC website. So I encourage you, um, people do falter back and forth or go back and forth of what preservation is versus conservation. Um, if you go to the AIC website, they actually do provide you with a definition of it. But we try to describe it as being conservation is a broad umbrella, if you will, 
and it encompasses things like preservation and collection care and treatment, which is actually what we call intervention um, when we do the treatments to the artifacts. So we try to use con conservation descriptively as a broad umbrella, and then the preservation being a part of it, um, more proactively caring for these items in a very proactive way. Um, so that's how, that's how we often will present it to the public. Okay. Susan, do you have something you want to add to that? Might have muted herself. I'm, uh, <laughs> Beth, you, you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I say I think of preservation um, as being um, all all encompassing and comprehensive, and it might be things that we do that that are um, what we call preventive maintenance. So it might be little things that we do to prevent damage would be what I would call a lot of preservation and in, 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 in basically in conservation. I often think of remedial treatments, um, but again, the AIC website is where, is where it's really defined accurately. <laughs> so <Okay>. next. <laughs> Beth, you want to add anything else in that? Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, at, a, at our institution, we kind of use the word preservation for kind of basic care of the materials. Um, anytime, we, anytime we here talk about conservation, it's in kind of the more scientific, more complicated um, um, needs of the collection that we, we, we don't have the basic skills here to do. So, Okay. Now, following up on that, it's still a, a kind of definitional question. When you say collections care, um, define that for me. This is Susan Blakeney. And again, I, when I think of collection care, I think of comprehensive care. Everything from storage to display to handling to the materials you use to lighting, environment. Collection care is everything that would make a collection last its longest. In my I mind. agree with that, Susan. That, that's, a, yeah. that's a really good definition, um, yeah. a way of speaking about it. It's, it's really involving anything that encompasses care, basically, of the artifacts themselves. And how about when it's a natural history collection? We had a couple questions about that. In, in which regard? Um, how to well, present um, it to the public or programs that could be associated with it? <laughs> here's, well, we could answer from all of those standpoints. Jean um, from Wilmington asked um, suggestions that you have for natural history collections where they typically don't treat but do preventative work. And there was a later question that came in also about um, natural history collections. Well, natural history collections are really interesting because of the type of preservation that needs to be done to keep these um, these pieces of the collection preserved moving forward. There's a lot of challenges involved with them. There's also a lot of stories um, that are linked with them, you know, how we used to preserve them, how we now preserve them. So giving, you know, talking about those stories could be really important. And the importance of these natural history collections. I mean, I didn't even have uh, as strong a knowledge of them when I entered into graduate school in conservation. I learned a lot more about natural history collections, and I thought, wow, I was always wondering why they collected these animals. Um, and conveying those stories to the public really helps them understand why you are collecting these items and then the challenges of preserving them, you know, and what it means when they're in alcohol and what happens to the information and what is the information that you're trying to retain in, those, in the care of those collections. So there is a lot of interesting stories, I think, that, that surround the natural history collections. You know, I, I also think of Susan Blakeney here, of natural history collections as having you, you, a unique need for the absolute best storage materials and mount making. You know, to, to actually store collections um, appropriately, you have to present them and store them correctly. Behind the scene tours of natural history collections could be really interesting to the public. They have no idea how many pieces you have in your collection and how you store them, which is so unique. And I think that would be a very interesting thing to actually do to show to the, the public. And the, the environmental conditions are, are a great thing to speak about because when you think about the, the color of the feathers on these birds and how important it is to identify these different animals, and you, you can't let light damage them because you're losing information if you do that. So, you know, again, this idea of preservation and care, as Susan pointed out, is real important. And behind the scenes, I agree with you, Susan. That, that's a great idea. 
and also the idea of that, that most people don't realize that our early mounts and, and we, our early taxidermy is highly toxic. And our homes and the whole country is filled with these lovely stuffed animals, but people really don't know how poisonous they can be. So there's a lot of education that could go on as well. Well, that would make me sit up and take notice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the, the whole concept of talking about story is coming out loud and clear. And, um, for instance, Tamara um, echoed something that I had written on the side about um, uh, how do you get all of these stories? You've told about a couple of programs, but um, any additional ideas that you want to share? Well, I thought it was great that Beth brought up, um, this is Amber, Beth Tice brought up this idea of um, Don't Leave Grandma in the Attic, the Milwaukee Public Library. Um, that was actually given by Debbie Hess Norris. And when you invite, as I, as I suggested, inviting a conservator maybe to come and give a talk about how to care for photographs or quilts or whatever it may be, it's amazing how people show up with these treasures in their pockets. And when she did that, there was a gentleman who stepped forward, and she's a big Beatles fan, Someone stepped forward with a photograph that a photographer had taken in Philadelphia, I think, at this very limited concert where they only allowed one photographer there, and he was a descendant of this photographer and presented that material to her. So you never know who's going to show up with a story at one of these public events that you may, you may organize, and people get to hear that story. Well, and we have, this is Beth, we have a um, football coach who is a very popular um, when our team was winning, and uh, but the, he's still beloved by our community. And when we mentioned that we were looking at doing Civil War stuff, he came forward and he has a m huge Civil War collection from his own family. And so he's going to be reading some of the his personal letters at our event, but also since we know about him ahead of time, I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to try and capture some of this digitally and put together a small video that we could then link to off of either the city's web pages or you know our university's web pages because he has he's such a wonderful storyteller himself so since we've already identified him we could use this as PR for the event coming up we can also use it just as just you know for a, the beginnings of a really nice web page that can pull our community together so we're excited about that Beth, um, while you were describing your events in the, in the hotel lobby, a question came in about what if, you're, what if your place is too small to do a program like that? Do you have any ideas for those institutions that are smaller? To do like a preservation clinic? Yeah. Um, we've had, we had talked to some other people that had done the clinic and they just kept it smaller. They kept, um, they had one or two tables and just one or two people assisting, and then they just kept the flow of the traffic coming through a different way. So I still think you could do it and invite the entire community to it. You might limit it, limit the clinic to a specific format so that you're not having everybody bring in all kinds of things that maybe keep it to letters or Bibles or something so that you don't have just this massive amount of materials coming in and then you don't feel like you can get to everybody. So you might just limit it to a certain type of thing. Yeah, I, this is Susan um, Blakeney, and I also think that if you if your group is so small that you simply don't have the staff or the volunteers to put on a workshop, then just put on a lecture series. Even if even that is a, is a very stimulating for the public, and a lecture series could be designed for the public's family heirloom. So it'd be something interesting to them. Like everybody has photo albums. Everybody has treasures that they want to save for the next generation. But they need to know how to take care of these and how to store them because things are stored so badly in their attics. And also they should think of if they had a disaster, what would be the three most important things they would try to save and how would they save them? So I think there's a lot of things you can do on a smaller scale with lecturing. Okay. Um, here's a really interesting question that just came in, and since we were on the, store, on the topic of story, I want to take this a little out of sequence, but do, do you have to worry about the rights to stories? There are. Um, it's similar to if you've ever done an oral history with someone. I mean, it's the sim similar type thing that we'll, we would get them to um, sign something ahead of time, agreeing to having this as something digital that's online. Um, the, 
the group, the web page at the University of Maryland has some nice information about um, kind of a form to use. Okay. Okay. And here is a question specific for Susan that came in from Jeff in Indianapolis. Um, were there any concerns that you had with the Borrow and Barrow program and the IRS? Gee, <laughs> I, don't, I, I never heard of any problems with the IRS. <laughs> because what they were doing was they actually donated money to the gallery. The gallery used that money in return to treat the painting. They did pay for the insurance uh, fine art insurance themselves, the people that borrowed it, and they considered the, I guess it was considered basically just, I don't know, we never had an issue come up, <laughs> but it is a question. I think if we, if you ask them, maybe it would be. <laughs> I okay. have no idea. But we actually chose paintings, too, that we considered, you know, if something were to happen to it, it wasn't like a prized piece, but we had a lot of multiples of things. So we we had a we we certainly had a whole group of paintings that we said we would never ever lend, but we did have a group of paintings that that were languishing and there was such a storage problem that it really helped solve two things at once. And we this program has been going on for maybe 15 years and we've never ever had a painting damaged, other than one painting fell off of a wall. That was all. Wow, what a you great know, track but, record! And everything was in perfect condition when it went to them because it had just been restored. <laughs> uh huh. Completely, you know. So that was the deal. Now, that leads to the next question that came in from um, Cindy in York, Pennsylvania. How do you balance or foresee balancing the move to making things more accessible, uh, the objects accessible, versus um, uh, this approach to preserving or limiting access? Well, if I, this is Amber. Um, if I can interject here a moment, you know, when we talk about an object in, say, our gallery tours, that's where it's really been nice to have these little samples uh, so that we can show them examples of even deterioration. I mean, we've got, you know, some paintings that have been donated to us that are just, they're just beyond repair. They're relics. And, but we can show people. We can use them as didactics or teaching tools. That's what a didactic is. I think we saw an earlier question asking what a didactic is, and that's something that you can present um, and use as a teaching tool, um, something visual, something tactile. They can touch it. They can hold it. Um, and that's where we also will, you know, if, you, if you're talking about a quilt, you can give them a sample of a quilt that they can hold. But then you can also talk about, you know, how the stitches are or what it's made out of and what these things feel like. And the public really loves this idea when we use these samples on our tours of being able to touch things. Our frames conservator is, is great about when he talks about gilding. He'll take out, um, you know, a piece of, of, uh, of, of gilded metal, and then he'll pass it around, and people will think, oh, they can hold it, and then it just, you know, evaporates in their hand, and they think that that's amazing, you know, where they get it stuck on their fingers. So, you know, you don't need to have them touch the actual object for them to experience the, the uh, frailty of the objects themselves. Um, you can use other things, smaller examples, and they really do like passing it around and sort of engaging with uh, whatever the sample is you give them. Yeah, I would agree with that as well, that sam you know, samples are great. We have a, actually a little tiny box full of paint flakes <laughs> that we pass mm -hmm. around. And yeah. the kids absolutely go crazy. They usually come back pulverized. But uh, <laughs> it really oh. it gets the point across. <laughs> Susan, I'm just kind of curious. You mentioned that the class that did this phenomenal fundraising mm -hmm. in 2000. So they have probably graduated now. Yeah, they're all From college students, school. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, did anyone go into museum science? Um, I don't know, but I actually know a couple of the mothers in town here. I could find out, but I, I don't know. What a know. great introduction to yeah. that. You know, I, I personally, I think that yeah. it, had really I experienced... Kept, it, when I lectured to the kids about humidity, you know, I made them all blow into mirrors and, and fog them, and, you know, having them do a lot of things made them understand it pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they really did. I was amazed how they took off with that. But I think actually the the, the box of paint shards plus the humidity lecture <laughs> and the and the real need plus showing them like a before and after of a treatment, they just couldn't believe it. Right, and like, they make, like they, they make those connections beautifully, yeah. don't they, Susan? I mean, right. it's when we give our tours and we have those. It's amazing. I think one of the questions that was earlier was asking, you know, how do you get them to tell their stories? They don't think their stories are important, but in reality, when they start hearing these things, they start making associations. Mm -hmm. With right. their own and, 
their own treasures. And they start going, oh, wait a minute, we keep that in this awful box, you know, underneath, you know, in the basement. And they start imagining what could be happening to that, you know, grandma's quilt that's down Mm -hmm. in the basement area. I think one I think one young student brought a painting then that he got at the dump at the swap shop that somebody <laughs> had thrown away and he wanted to rescue it and he and he brought it and his parents brought it to us and said, Well, you know, he really wants to do this and we're thinking of doing it for his birthday and, and you know, they didn't really want to spend a lot of money and the painting was considered disposable. However, they did do this and we did this treatment and this little child was absolutely thrilled. That's funny. <laughs> that is really neat. Yeah. Um, okay, going back to small museums, what about people who aren't conservators but still have to do collections care? Well, I think you need to bring a conservator in to give a workshop to your volunteers because you can be taught to do the kind of housekeeping and maintenance that you should be doing routinely. And you need to get a professional conservator to come in and, and do a, a specific workshop for you. And the American Institute for Conservation website, you know, that's a great resource. Um, and they're actually trying to promote, you know, outreach and, and information education to the public. So, you know, contact them. That's what they're there for. Uh, contact them with questions. If you're a small institution and you need help, you know, go to these resources that are available to you and say, this is what I'd love to do. Is there anyone in my area that would be willing to collaborate with us to do this? Because especially if it's a private conservator, Um, A number of these private conservators that I know that will do these small little lectures for free for libraries or small collections, it helps them. You know, they get to know their community. And as I said, you know, it's amazing who shows up. And then they get connected with clients. The clients learn about the collection care and the challenges. I mean, there's a lot of simple collaborations that can go on. So if you need a conservator, you know, go to the AIC website, engage with them, ask them, tell them what you want to do, and and see where that goes. But you've got to initiate that. You've got to reach out there. Beth, Susan, you have anything to add to that? Uh, let me think. <laughs> I did a minute ago, but I think it just flew out of my head. <laughs> this is Beth, and I think that's what's happening, Amber, with you know some of our partnerships we created last year. Is that now we're able to work together, and we're going to um, we're working with the community, the county library, to be able to pull money together to get someone up to work with photographs this week. This this next spring. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. And I couldn't have done it just on my own, but because we created these partnerships, now we're going to go in together on the cost of bringing someone in. Mm -hmm. You get your name name associated with this partnership. I mean, even Mm -hmm. if it's not hosted at your particular site, but, you know, you're part of a teaming that makes this happen for the community, you know, your, your collection is a part of that. You're a partner of it. Yes. Uh, I'm going to say we once held a, a workshop where we invited collection managers and to actually come and learn how to do their own preservation framing. Framing is a huge problem in museums, and it can be very expensive. But if you can know how to appropriately unframe and reframe something yourself, it gives you a lot of advantages. And maybe you don't want, maybe on your own place you couldn't do this, but if you could find a conservator and maybe a group of you could organize as a group workshop for even maybe more than one institution if you felt that your group was too small to organize it all by yourself. But I think that there are regional centers, regional conservation centers, and they offer lots of workshops as well. And you might not be on their mailing list, so you, you might not even know about these offerings. But that's another source for a lot of uh, instruction for your staff. There was mention earlier to the popular Antiques Roadshow um, program. Are there other um, contemporary cultural icons that you could think of for invoking enthusiasm among the community for the collections they may have in their homes and the stories they may bring to you? Just the History Channel has some really good shows on occasion. Um, they actually feature, they used to have a thing where you could write in a story and they would feature it, too. Hmm. And um, you could do that locally. Right, you right. Could. Yeah. I don't I, remember which one of you brought out the importance of getting the press involved, but I'm sure that you all have opinions about that as you yeah. work with the community. Right, and I, I, I'm in a very small community, population 4,000, so, <laughs> you know, the little press is very small, and when you submit an article, they don't always even run it. 
However, you have to write your own articles and submit them. If you're lucky, they will run it. But we just keep bombasting them. And every, every small museum, if you ever have a conservation treatment done, you know, blow your horn. Get some publicity about it. If you win a grant, have an article done about this. Get a before and after photograph in the paper. And because that, it actually encourages more donations to you. People think, wow, they're taking care of their things. And you are, so you should be proud of it. We were lucky, this is Beth, we were lucky in our community that the Preservation Week fell in the same month that they were celebrating um, 100th anniversary of the um, city park. And so um, someone had been doing kind of a series of um, articles in the paper, so we were able to kind of fold ours, our event up under that as a, another kind of care, care preservation um, Piece and so that that got an article run. Then that was able. To, we were after that. We were able to do some ads for the event as well. But I agree with Susan. Any time that there's anything to celebrate, get it out there. Whether it's on Facebook or or even in the paper. I mean, it's huge. That's even how we got newsletter. most of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we got most of our audience was from that one article that showed up in the paper. And if you have a website, I believe you should have a wish list on your website of things you needed to be donated. I mean, people all have extra things. You'd be surprised at what people have that you might need in storage or somehow in your office or whatever. But if people don't know it, then they're never going to donate it to you. Right. Okay, and audience. Amber, I think I brought up during my presentation that... Uh, and if you're working with a conservator, the AIC website does have a part, uh, section where they say, you know, tell your story. And um, they would probably be very interested. I mean, they're always looking for new stories to post. And they don't need to be long, you know, stories. They can be just a couple paragraphs. And for those who follow things like the Art Newsletter online or Art Daily, you know, they just put in little snippets. But these places, they're, they're, they're publishing daily, and sometimes they need to fill their, their coffers, if you will, with stories. So don't hesitate to keep resubmitting and trying. You know, you just never know. Um, who will grab the story and run with it, which is great for your collection. You know, another idea I've often wanted to see implemented with every conservation treatment, which would be like a stiff piece of card that would be something you could hold in your hand, maybe slightly bigger than a printed page, that you would have a before and after photo at a minimum, and then a very small, you know, interesting to read paragraph or two about the treatment. And that should be in a pocket on the wall in the gallery where the piece is exhibited. So even if you don't have an exhibition about preservation, that information is right there. And as anybody who's coming and touring the gallery could pick these up and go, wow, this was recently treated, and sit there or stand there and look at it and, and get this education. And I think that would be a, a very easy way and something that could be kept in storage. And every time that's exhibited, that could come out again. This is Amber. Those, those storyboards work so well for us, and they really work well also in, I'm a part of the Washington Conservation Guild, when we do those angel projects days, um, you know, building that material for that site that we've worked at for the day so that they can see that there's this activity where people are coming in, they're helping to rehouse things, they're helping to care for these collections, and they use it as a great media day, they take pictures, they keep those pictures on the storyboards, and they're able to talk about that for a period of time. And, and just as Susan said, it's a great resource. And, and it's, again, the storytelling. It's the connecting the public to the story of your collection, which is really vital. The public actually, to them, conservation is magic. <laughs> they don't really understand is. it. <laughs> and they just go, wow. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it's accessible. We found that during our tours, yeah. you know, when you talk about these mm -hmm. things, they, they find it an easy way. It's, it's very blue-collar to them in some ways. You know, we are with our hands working with the artifacts, we're preserving them, we're treating mm -hmm. them, and they feel connected to it, and they don't feel like they have to have gotten a degree in art history to understand the object anymore. They're actually, they have a story behind it, and they love that. Mm -hmm. They really engage with it. I always tell the public that watching us is like watching the grass grow. It's a very slow process, so you only need to watch us for a few minutes and then move on to something else. Because <laughs> 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 each step takes quite a while. <laughs> Here's a great question that just came in from Elizabeth Martin um, about your recommendations for approaching or motivating colleagues who think we shouldn't engage with the public, um, and especially with social media, um, that it may overshadow the objects or become too invasive. 
Hmm. Well, I would say um, ask them to let you give it a chance on one thing and then see what the response is because I think they would be really surprised to see how positive an interaction it is. I mean, I've yet to really have an example I can give you about a negative. You know, when we when we told the story of the artifact using one of these um, outlets, you know, whether it be Facebook or a blog article, um, it's great to see the response people have. And I don't know why they're, you know, what the person's reasoning for not wanting to do it would be, but, you know, give it a chance and see, you know, and, and at least try it. We had some, this is Beth, we had some, um, a little pushback when we first started our event, and and what we ended up doing was involving that person more with our, especially with some of the digital pieces to it. I mean, I think it was just kind of an an unknown piece to them. And once we had them kind of get their hands in with us on the event, then they felt more comfortable about what was going to happen. So I think the more information they have and the more information you can give them, I think that helps bring them um, along the ride with you. We have a we have a, a few more minutes for any late questions that come in. I did post up an evaluation for folks to access, and um, this has been very interesting. Very interesting. I do want to let the audience know we have one final webinar a week from today, and that is on the bookshelf series, again, specific to the care of paper, photographs, and audiovisual collections. Um, so exactly one week from today. So there's one more webinar that you might want to attend. You know, one more point I might bring up. Um, Beth, you just gave some great advice about involving the person. Uh, is also to, to show them potentially other really successful stories. That wiki site that I spoke about um, that uh, Nancy Ravenel um, runs and shows how is new media can be used um, and the wiki sites can be used. Uh, it really gives a lot of examples of, of people that are out there doing that right now. So maybe showing them different examples about how this is a success for some things um, could, could maybe generate their interest and enthusiasm a little bit more as well. Um, and then, of course, the involvement that Beth recommended is a great idea. Um, Amber, one last question about Facebook. Do you have uh, about image rights. Well, when we posting. post yeah we post images of um, either people that or that are working here or images that are part of our collection. We're a public collection. Um, we do not post images that have children in them unless we've gotten authorization to to post those images. So we don't often we'll, we will show if we show groups of adults that's one thing. But you know there are protocols. Um, and I think Beth, did you provide a site that gave some good information on? Um, I don't know if she did well, or not. Well, the, the um, digital storytelling does have some information about just the, the idea of an interview. So there may be some things about rights on that page. I haven't seen it yet. but Right. I mean, I wouldn't recommend, you know, going around taking pictures of other people's collections. <laughs> but certainly your own. You know, you have rights to those images and, um, and you know, using them on Facebook. Um, we, we will often even talk about analysis. I've done treatments and... What's nice, you know, being that we are, you know, the Smithsonian, we have people from around the world coming here, they see in our center, they see something being worked on, and then they leave, and they don't know what the end of the story is. So we tell that story on the Facebook. It's sort of like a storyboard that's available to them through Facebook to see what, how the project got started before and after treatments. And if we've done some analysis, we can talk about x-rays, we can talk about infrared, we can talk about cross-section analysis, and provide those images up online, again, to continue that story. Right. For conservatives in private practice, this is Susan Blakeney. Um, whenever I do something educational, I have to always make sure that I get them to sign off and you know, that I get permission to use the images. Everything I do is considered confidential. Often we're working for a private individual, but even for the museum it's confidential. So, but if it's your museum and they're your things, then you know whether or not you can use them. But when you involve other museums' pieces or anyone's images, you, you want to get them to sign something that you have permission to use them for educational purposes. And oftentimes they'll want to say that they'd like to have um, credit, that that piece came from them, and sometimes not. Sometimes if you use a portion of an image and not an entire thing, you don't need that necessary permission unless it's rec easily recognizable, I think. By the way, do you have to worry about people taking images from Facebook? 
I don't know. I would have thought so. <laughs> We've not run into that yet, this Amber. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank our guests again. Um, very informative, very interesting, uh, all three of you, and how you're approaching the education of the of the public in getting them involved in collections and conservative conservation. And um, so, thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you, audience, for staying with us. And I hope to see you next week as we finish out our series. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you guys.